Weight Free Wellness Podcast number 12. Welcome to the Weight Free Wellness Podcast, helping you through the ups and downs with weight, self image, and health. Sharing resources, interviews with experts, and inspirational personal stories. Inflammation affects each of us each and every day. In this podcast with Dr. Rory Faraday, a chiropractor and functional medicine practitioner in the Minneapolis area, we talk about how prolonged inflammation can lead to everything from belly aches to leaky gut and dementia, and most of all, how to address inflammation naturally. As always, you can find the show notes at weightfreewellness.com. Just go to episode 12, and there's lots to listen to, lots to catch here in this episode, so enjoy. What I am really surprised in myself is how long I was eluded by what inflammation actually means, and I, I'm pretty sure I still don't fully understand. I mean, how yeah. would you explain that to someone? Because um, you use the word a lot. Yeah. Well, I think everybody has a different interpretation that is subjective to what inflammation means. Our most common understanding is I slipped, I fell, you know, I hurt myself. So pain then is a common reaction to the stimuli of hurting or falling or reacting to something. It doesn't matter if you eat something or fall on something. So, um, so then that's inflammation, right? That's the pain stimuli. So, um, so that, that can be, you know, superficial, can be skeletal. Um, we have a lot of people who get it. We're relating inflammation these days a lot to the GI, you know, to the gastro, to the stomach, you know, especially relating to autoimmunity, you know. And then there's a lot of people who get brain inflammation. <laughs> Jones didn't get the message this time. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. He just shows up at the right times, doesn't he? He's just, yeah. Um, so what I find... What I'm wondering too is there are certain symptoms that show up, but we're kind of labeling. So like even heat could be a sign of inflammation, pain. Um, what is actually happening? Is there anything really happening or is inflammation just a general term? Well, you can go, you can get as physiological about it as you want. So you've heard of calor, dalor, you know, so this is color and it gets inflamed. So the tissue gets, we get a response. It's kind of like eating a food that doesn't agree with, with us and we get a bloat, <clears throat> like a gluten response. So that's inflammatory, you know? So think of it as a, a tire, you know, you blow up a balloon and it just gets a little bit bigger. So if it's skeletal, it's surely you can see it on your skin and it gets bigger. But if it's stomach, um, it makes it bigger. So constipation can be an aspect of inflammation too. And brain can get inflammation. But the problem with the brain and inflammation is we don't feel it, you know? Hmm. We don't, so we don't do just the symptoms show up later with brain inflammation for most people? Well, this is one of the reasons why, you know, like brain surgery, you don't need um, anesthesia. You can be wide awake during, um, during brain surgery. So we don't have the pain fibers in the brain. You know, we just don't like the idea of having to drill into the brain during surgery, but people are been known to be wide awake. Um, so we don't have the pain fibers to really tell us what's going on there. So inflammation in the brain, remember, looks like, like we have it in epidemic forms right now in our culture is dementia, Alzheimer's, um, you know, trying to finish sentences, finding words, uh, names. So it's not 60, 70, 70 year old individuals who are getting these expressions now, it's 40 and 50 year olds. So that's brain inflammation, that's an aspect, that's another different type of inflammation. So brain at fatigue is kind of looked at relating to the gut as an aspect, as another symptom of inflammation. So you're coming back to your question, you know, falling on the ground, scraping our knee, um, that's the most quantifiable, the most understandable way that we understand inflammation. You know? When it actually affects us overtly yeah. like that. So it's a buffer response, you know, it's a histamine re reaction. It brings in all the prostaglandins, the proteins, the things that kind of if there is dirt, if there is anything that is going to cause infection, you know, so it brings in all the help that we need, you know, from the body. So there's actually a benefit to inflammation too. Absolutely. You know, yeah. so there's a fine balance between, because, you know, culturally we use a lot of, you know, anti-inflammatories or we use opioids to numb pain. Uh, and sometimes chronically, if we use too many of those things, it can uh, impede the healing response then, right? How, how would they impede the healing response? 
it, it helps with the pain, but it impedes the healing process. It does long term. You know, they like to think and say that a lot of the drugs are, uh, or the pharmaceuticals are anti-inflammatory, and they're not really. You know, so a lot of people take corticosteroids, and there may be times that you have to. So if I get somebody who's not sleeping for two, three nights in a row or four nights, and they just got to get up, they got to work, or there's something showing up. And if I find that they're healthy individuals and I know they'll adapt and get over the consequence of the corticosteroid, then I will be more apt to ask them to network with a specialist that we may have and say, yeah, I would consider a corticosteroid because initially corticosteroids will numb the acute pain, right? So that means the sudden onset of pain, but chronically it doesn't really do a whole lot for us. And this is where things like you've heard of turmeric and curcumin, they kind of come in to play a lot. So those aren't really very good for us. I won't say very good. Those are not the right terms to use. Uh, in the acute phase, so when something initially happens to us and we have an inflammatory response, the corticosteroid is always going to be more numbing. But long term, the curcumin, the turmerics, the gingers um, will be a lot better for us. Absolutely. Don't it, the body doesn't the body adapt to corticosteroids, so they're less effective over time? Isn't that what happens? I'm just kind of jogging my memory. I don't remember if that's true. It does. It's very subjective. I mean, I get patients who get a great response from a corticosteroid in a hip, a hip pain if they don't want to do surgery. And, you know, we do the body work. So, you know, what else is available to them? And corticosteroid is kind of like that bridge, that in-between time, or it's buying time for you. Um, so you don't have to do the invasive surgical, you know, procedure. And some people I notice that can get a great response for six, 12. Sometimes people can get a, an 18 month response. Other people I find they have to do it three, four, five times in the space of a year, you know? So it is a number of the, um, it is, you got to remember it is, um, we all know now through, um, through research that corticosteroids are number the, one of the two, if not three or four top reasons for uh, joint degradation uh, long-term. So we kind of want to limit its use, but it is useful. We do need it. So do the corticosteroids and the curcumin or turmeric work differently or similarly in the body? Well, it, it, it's like throwing a big boulder and the other one is like throwing a lot of small stones at something. Hmm. So one is, it's going to, it's, it just works with the body better. You know, a lot of um, things that are made in lab by man seemingly are a little bit more aggressive by nature. So, you know, it's it's kind of by working things in tandem. You know, I don't want to say that one is bad and one is good. That's not the truth. It's just when to use them correctly. Yeah, they each have their time and place. They do, yes. There's a really great product that you recommended. I don't know with your practice if we can mention, it is a Metagenics product that's um, specific to intense inflammation. And one of our employees uh, recently came down. He has chronic episodes of, um, what is the advanced chicken pox? What's it called again? Uh, it starts with S. Why am I not remembering? Shingles. shingles. There we go. And um, he keeps coming down with it. And, you know, the way that I learned herbalism and medicine, you know, that kind of natural medicine is you look at what's going on under underneath it all. You right. know, it's not the symptom of what's showing up necessarily on the surface. It's, you know, what's going on underneath that's causing all that. And so I brought over some supplements. I don't prescribe or recommend, but I will provide certain things for people to choose to use should they like to. And I brought over this supplement that's really a combination of anti-inflammatories um, as well as one that help, helps to the TRANQ that helps to really calm the body. And um, I know the first time I took that, it has the turmeric or curcumin and the cayenne as well. And just an amazing difference. I mean, I went from feeling tense and stressed and just kind of achy in general to yeah. just chill. Right. I mean, it would probably be the best way to put it. And I, I gave some of those to him to try. And I heard the other day, he said to my husband, who was his employer, uh, he said, you know, I, he did well the other day, he said, but I can't wait to get home and take those supplements again and just yeah. 
chill out. Well, that's good <laughs> but it's hear. really amazing, you know. It's not until we have an experience that yeah. sometimes we know until we – it isn't until we have these experiences that we really know how stressed and inflamed our bodies are. Absolutely. And a lot of time we don't know what's going on until we actually do something about it or, or remove it or – you know, um, like we, we have this little saying where if you remove three thumbtacks, if you have four thumbtacks under your foot, you know, and you still have one thumbtack left, so you're still feeling pain, but it's not as intensive, right? Yeah. I'm assuming that tum is thumb in Irish. What's that? I'm assuming that tum is thumb in Irish, right? Yes, thumbtack. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Why? What do you call it here again? Is there another? <laughs> I don't know. How do you say three? Uh, tree. Right. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> There's right. no TH. All right. I was just confirming. The linguist in me had to know if it was congruent across sure. the board. It's another one of those molybdenum cases, you know. <laughs> A little simpler, it sounds. Yeah. Funny. Yeah. So one thumbtack or four, there's still pain. You know, harken back to your you know, you're reflecting on your uh, scenario there. I mean, that's great that you brought up in how we have to calm the, the central nervous system too during the fight or flight response and how that's attached to inflammation. So the stressors, you know, the stress response to trauma is a very natural, it's a very autonomic response in our body. So somebody in a car accident, and if I'm looking at them, I'm certainly gonna do uh, nervous system calmers with them along with anti-inflammatories long-term. And it makes sense, right? Because the body's kind of vigilant, right? So it got hit and doesn't, we don't like to be hit without our consent or not knowing that we got hit. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Right. So we kind of log that in we log it into our system that we're going to avoid that again in the future, right? So it's a survival mechanism and we have to kind of keep that in balance. We've got to check that out, you know? So that's a sympathetic response. The parasympathetic, remember, is rest and digest. So if we're looking at everything as being trauma, traumatizing, and, you know, then it's going to be difficult for us to shift over here into the other state. So certainly doing uh, the herbal commerce makes a big difference. Like we talk about valerians and radiolas, passion flowers. Those are really good and help during trauma time. And hops, no wonder some people, hops. especially like beer. Yes, hops. So the right hops, right? The real hops. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't know how much hops are putting in beer actually anymore. It just seems to be just like foods. They seem to be synthetic uh, stimulators or emulators, you know, so they don't really, I don't know how much hops they put in it anymore, you know. Well, I'm sure it depends. Well, from the cooking side of me, it, I imagine it depends on the recipe too. Right, right. Of whether it's a hoppy beer. So my, how we get on tangents. <laughs> so with the, the central nervous system, it, that's, I think, really important to bring up. I mean, it, to me, what comes to mind is that if, if a person were to grow up in an environment where they're constantly stimulated, or maybe that they, were, they grew up essentially in the womb where the central nervous system was constantly stimulated, or maybe there was a traumatic time in the womb or growing up, we're essentially programmed yeah. to be that way. And so we don't know any difference sometimes until we have an experience uh, yeah. You, a lot of times it's ingesting something that seems right. to break that uh, or create that news in NLP they call the news of difference, right? Where you right. can notice the difference between one state and another. Right. And that's what continually astounds me is when I experience that myself, remembering that someone else very, very well may not know. If I am coaching them, let's say, and I say, you know, just, just relax, you know, but their body doesn't know what relax means no we all have different notions of what relaxed is you know and you know you'll hear the likes of you know i just watched tony robbins free netflix thing the other day and he's a he's a very high intensity guy and he always talks about states of beings that we're in you know and if it's not serving a purpose for you how do you shift your reality or your state of being so he uses a lot of high intensity things you've heard of people walking on coals you know um, he uses cryotherapy, which is below freezing. So he uses a lot of high intensity formats of shifting reality, you know? Well, even his, his um, I watched that too, which is great, by the way. And I didn't even mention it to John, but John selected it like two days later to, yeah. for us to watch, which is really cool. I love it when that stuff happens. Good. But even, even that seminar that he does, you yeah. know, I remember I read in a book that 
that like the room he has set at 50 degrees or something and they go like all day so he and he mentions this in the documentary that he's yeah. you know he's changing the the state of being so that yeah. people can be in that intensely changed environment to then beget more change yes yeah i mean they work hand in hand don't they so yeah we, um, you know a, a lighter format of that that wouldn't be so intensive would be to allow yourself to be in nature you know so for instance we pick on golf you know so we're so focused on dressing up you know getting some classes you know swinging the golf ball but in, in essence you're out in nature you're in all this green and it, and it kind of succumbs your ego you know because you know it's very difficult to play the game with your ego so involved you know and there's kind of a letting go process that is very organic that happens there you know and that's very very different to you know the tony robbins of walking on coals and you know shifting our states of reality so there's many forms of intensities that you can do it with just like we're talking the opioid drug or a corticosteroid and we're looking at you know like some herbal things that can help just as much long term and that it's just as effective if not more certainly turmeric and omega-3s you know fats and fish oils that's a really good bridge yes yeah in comparison or even a flower essence, which in essentially is water and alcohol. Right. A flower essence remedy can have just, a big, just as big of an effect as right. something that seemingly works on just the physical level. Right. And help remove that trauma or the, the state of being or help move to a different state of being. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We seem to a lot, you know, in, in psychologically in our culture in the world right now, we're we're really addressing a lot of PTSD events, you know, and it can be as little as something small and as big as something really big that can happen to somebody, you know, like a child surviving, um, like a concentration camp from World War II. And seemingly we now see that genetically that that is going down in lineage. So there's a lot of uh, children who are the offspring of the children coming out of the concentration camp seemingly are emitting a lot of the uh, more of the mental states, you know, whether it's schizophrenia, dementia, you know, bipolar. And, but apparently we can shift it around the, the other way too. So we can shift and make the other reality. There is a kind reality too, and not just a scared reality. Absolutely. And, you know, at the point where a person realizes that something is happening, that's a great point for change. You know, when you notice that, you know, this isn't working for me kind of thing. Right. Know you know, you... You had brought up in, in when we were discussing this topic to, to yeah. mention, you've brought this up several times about the, um, the pain, inflammation response, and opioids. And admittedly, I don't know much about opioids, you know, what, what that topic really entails. But you had brought up, um, you know, with our, within our community, it wasn't too long ago that Prince actually passed away. And... Um, you know, he's, his studio and home was within, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes of us. Yeah. So it was really, I mean, almost on a daily basis, I was going by the memorial. People are still showing up there, putting up memorial um, memorabilia. And it's, it is times like that or stories like that that really bring it to our attention that this is an issue. Um, Tell me more about what you were, what came to your mind and heart as you learned more about the story. And, and, and I agree with you. It, it really has impacted us, you know, not just that it's Prince and that he was from our generation, you know. I know I'm a little older than you, but that was certainly my, my generation, you know, and I just don't appreciate him as just an artist and just his music, but, um, but just the method and the mode of how he passed away, you know, he was just a little too young and people are a little bit upset that he was too young. And so, you know, there's this connection and, and I don't know if they want to really own up that this was really down to fentanyl, you know, so he was on the opioid drug fentanyl. So um, it is a one, it's a drug that it's in a classification of drugs called opioid drugs, you know, which basically they numb our pain a lot. So, and it is also the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. So remember, number one is going to be you know, cancer, and number two is going to be heart disease, three is hospital-related complications and death. Number four, then, is opioids. So fentanyl is one drug that is in that group. So you've heard of oxycodone as well. That's another drug that is in that group, you know. 
So these are called, they're Schedule II drugs, you know, um, by the FDA. So they can cause, you know, if you are on them long term, it just means that if you're on them long term, they can create a lot of problems for us. And then, of course, the biggest side effect is death. <laughs> so uh, just to let you know, um, there is a statistic that is out there that a lot of people know about. You can Google it. Um, so the drug that Prince was on, fentanyl, um, they're saying that one person dies every four minutes four minutes wow. from, from that, just with that one drug. You wow. Know? Yes. So we're obviously trying to come up, I think as a culture, we're trying to come up with other modes um, of how we can do this that is so, you know, not as, as, as invasive. And so we need to look at things like, you know, fats, uh, look at our stress formats, look at things like, um, we were talking about turmeric and curcumin, gingers, you know, look at these things. Um, and then from that point, then we can look at, we can reflect on other aspects. You know, those are things that bring down the fire initially, but long-term we want to see how we are, you know, working in reality then. There's, you know, it's seemingly simple, but it's really complex. And I wonder personally, and I'm going back to kind of more the family dynamic and what we, what we learned to do and be growing up, uh, because that's how you're going to typically operate, you know, so you can take, um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure why my mind keeps going back. Well, I know why it goes back in that direction because I had to do a lot of reprogramming myself into not self-induced inflammation, anxiety, um, whether it came up in, in the central nervous system, you know, actually feeling the, the anxiety, it threw off my endocrine system, threw off my cycles. Um, so that had to be treated not only with proper food and nutrition, and changing my diet because certain foods were aggravating me, but also changing how I thought about things, how I reacted to life, because I was I learned to react in a feel, fearful way. And I'm sure a lot of other people are in that situation too. I know I'm not the only one that learned to respond that way. Um, and we live in a relative, relatively safe society here in the U.S., in most parts of the U.S., you know, so it almost seems silly that anyone should really grow up fearful, but it's so, it's so subjective, you know, how you're going to respond. Um, so I'm sure your treatment when you're working with people, it's very uh, sub subjective and how you're going to respond and do that with, with people. Um, I remember I was trying to look for the documentary. I don't remember the name of it, but there's a really great documentary about heroin use in the New England area of the U.S. and how it's just off the charts. And um, the gist of it is that these uh, young people were put on these drugs at a very young age, you know, um, teens, late teens, maybe even early adulthood. And once the insurance ran out, they had no longer had access to these drugs. And so they went to the street drugs that were helping them, they thought, you know, through these uh, whatever whatever they were prescribed these drugs for. And it's, it's really astonishing that such a powerful drug can so easily be prescribed. And um, I don't really know what direction, uh, you know, this podcast in general, I'm trying to help people uh, hear about other solutions in a very easy kind of way to sure. digest, you know? Well, we're we were talking earlier, you know, about Prince. And so the biggest side effect of these things eventually is when it derails you from life. So that means we're not engaged in life. We're not engaged in communication or, or intimacy or, or connecting with other people. You know, uh, we derail so easy from when we're on these drugs, a lot of the time they can derail us, you know, so it's, we don't want to go to that high intensity. So having people getting familiar from a younger age with that, there are other choices out there. So we shouldn't be really jumping from as soon as a trauma occurs that we jump all the way to, you know, an opioid. And because what happens is people love like, wow, that's a very numbing feeling. So I can keep doing more of that situation and, and I can keep taking that drug. And so it's kind of like being in a bumper car and you're keep bumping against stuff. And, but your way of getting from A to B is just bumping against things, but you don't feel anything in the car and you're just fine, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not really using our navigational skills very well as a human. 
And especially if it, it, you're taking it at such a young age, you don't have the experience otherwise either. Yeah, I mean, when that's all that we know, and, and, and that's ridiculous to think that that is all that is available, when there's so much more that's available. So I think learning to be human right now, we're kind of at that time in history, you know, when um, we're learning more about our bodies, learning how we're interacting, you know, like the term vulnerability, I hear it more with people these days, you know, people aren't bothering making depth and friendships unless there's a, a sense of vulnerability there. I mean, otherwise, we're just talking about the weather and football and, you know, a lot of facade oriented things. So I think that all these things tie in at the end of the day, you know, it goes back to inflammation, you know, and certainly checking in with where it is in our body, you know, and working with it. So I tend to work with people's guts more because it seems to be the seat of inflammation in our body a lot. So if you're taking a fat or taking curcumin or turmeric, and if you don't have the right system available to break them down correctly, and if you want to work with brain inflammation, but the body says, no, I want you to work with skeletal inflammation first. So it takes all those resources away. And so you're not really getting the target location. So that's why sometimes the corticosteroid, because it's an injection. And we understand through the ego format that, oh, there's inflammation and pain in my left knee. I'm going to put that injection in there. And it's a direct and it's focal. And we understand that. We totally get that. But there is a systemic form of inflammation. And so autoimmune is the term that we hear a lot these days. We hear a lot of things relating to autoimmune, which is MS. You know, we think of rheumatoid arthritis. These are common themes that are tied in with, uh, with autoimmune, especially things like type 1 diabetes, not type 2, type 1. So we want to start working with the gut immediately. And we use terms like, you've heard it, and it's been out floating around there for a long time for decades now and now finally we're kind of giving it a, a diagnostic term so terms like leaky gut mm -hmm. so we've heard these so leaky gut is very tied into inflammation very much so i can definitely attest that addressing the diet may be so almost be overlooked because it's it's like you know how could that have such a, a big effect but for me personally um for the aforementioned reasons and even having early on the symptoms. I was never diagnosed. It was before they were actually diagnosing celiac disease and IBS, but had really significant uh, reactions to food. Uh, and that was the, the thing that made the biggest change. You know, it seems like the smallest change to make, but in my experience and even in talking with others, that that is such an easy change to make and it makes such a dramatic difference for the whole body not just for the digestive system but you just can overall feel so much better well that's what lifestyle change means you know things that are at your fingertips that you can make a decision with and food of course is a very easy one you know mm -hmm. um things that you know the, the clients that i get biggest reactions with are the food-based clients you know and but then there are people after that it's a little bit more complicated it's um complex so we look in we look at things like uh, pathogens, you know, we can have that can cause inflammatory reactions. So you've heard of candida. Mm -hmm. um, we can get long-term or latent aspects of viruses like Epstein-Barr or mono or, uh, you know, like shigellas, which is a bacteria, you know, that can be from foods. So a lot of these things can be latent and we want to look for them because I can get people who eat well, they exercise well, and you can tell that they take care of themselves very well but there's something else going on in their system. So we got to do a little bit more investigative work. And then we see people who are not pathogen wise, you know, they don't have the infection state, but they may have a neurotransmitter problem. So we look at the endocrine aspect relating to thyroid hormone and the brain. So those are other ways. And then um, toxicity is another common, uh, term, common um, outlet. So we look at metals, you know, certainly we're living in times when there's high toxicity from, solvents and plastics and air quality you know so we kind of look at those and so you can keep going deeper down the line and seeing what things uh, what else can affect we talked on foods a while ago there are a lot of people who eat you know not so good food you know because it's so processed and refined and it's very inexpensive and it's highly addictive so that's why they want to make it readily available for you so that you keep purchasing it over and over and over so it's more available to the most of the population. So now we're buying a loaf of bread for $2, but it's so enriched and refined that it doesn't have any quality to it. So it's a negative caloric food. 
in essence, it takes more energy for your body to break it down than any energy that you receive from it. So it's a negative calorie. Well, it, negative in so many aspects too, that it can actually cause yeah. so much harm that you have to actually spend more time and energy to make up for anything that you may even be getting out of it. Right. So that's tying into the, the, the quality of the food then ties into deficiencies in nutrients. And so that is massive. So a lot of people with gut immunity problems or in chronic inflammation in the gut, we're looking certainly at as things like uh, isolates of vitamins like, like zinc, B12. Um, and you look at certainly magnesium is a big one. So those are very common nutrients that are going to be deficient in, in people, you know. Um, so, but then I also get people who are maybe long-term vegetarian people who may be deficient in these nutrients because they're not eating the proteins and that can create problems, especially hydrochloric can create a lot of acid problems in the stomach because they're not eating the foods that is necessary, uh, to utilize acids to break it down then. And so the body's saying, okay, you don't need this anymore. Let's shut that system down. So, um, so we need a balance, obviously. So it's, this is all investigative. So we do a good history with people and we kind of want to find out. And uh, we hinted at, at the beginning with stress. That was the first thing we spoke about. Mm -hmm. Stress is a biggie in this culture, you know. Um, I remember my, my grandpa would always talk about the difference between a first world problem and a third world problem. Mm -hmm. So we have to really help to tie into how you are relating with stress. We really have to help people, you know, that this alarmist, we live in an alarmist type world right now. And a lot of media tries to make us just spur that sympathetic nervous system on to get you to react. Right. And even though I'm aware at times, it's like, man, I got hooked up on that. You know, it can take you on a roller coaster. So I have to right. walk or like stop you from spinning again. One political headline and you're gone. Yeah. It's just, it's a lot of, yeah, it just spins us. A lot of Western media is very like that or just media in general. So stress can play a huge, huge role in people, you know. Absolutely. What was it that your grandpa would say about the difference oh, between the... Yes. So, yeah. uh, so if we ever came to him and, you know, we were crying and, or we had an issue and he would always say, you know, well, is, uh, hold on before you share anything that's going on. Is this a first world problem? Which means, is this, do you have a roof over your head? Is the house on fire? You know, did you lose a limb? And, you know, as, as kids would always say, well, no, grandpa, of course, I, I'm fine, you know? Oh, and then he'd say, great, it's just a first world problem, right? So we're looking at needs and wants and, and then those kind of things, you know, it's very, I won't say superficial, but it's very humanistic, you know? So we always want to differentiate between the type of pain. So giving an opioid uh, uh, to a person who is just going through not having a need met, you know, because this neighbor bought a nicer car than than he did, you know, so we don't need an opioid drug for that one, right? No, <laughs> but if he crashes the car, you know, the pain of, of that, you know, may just be a bit much. <laughs> right. No, that's a, that's a great illustration, you know, and it reminds me as far as the first world and third world problem, you know, about perspective. Um, I've heard a number of times um, actually, I think I'm mostly, I think I first heard it from my mother-in-law and we would be, she's definitely not the lecture type. So she'll say something more reflective, like, you know, if, if we all had the choice between doing, um, uh, if we had the choice, we have our own problems and if we all threw them in a pile, you know, yeah. we would all run for our own, no matter how bad you think that yours are now, yeah. you know, we would have run for our own problems and right. it's it's every time it's true you know you can hear someone else's story like okay yeah i'll take mine <laughs> right and is i wonder how much of that you you speak of being around your grandpa and here i'm going into the nostalgic family kind of stuff again but i think this is what i've um learned and have personally strived to do over the years is and you've talked about connection even in your office that I wonder how much of this need for opiates, this need for numbing and healing a pain can happen just through connection. And that, you know, we have things that show up symbolically in our bodies that really reflect what's going on in many ways in our lives. And it can be hard to palate it sometimes. 
Um, even I at times have to go, okay, is this really what's going on in a greater scheme as a metaphor? Um, but I think there's a lot of healing just in having a conversation with someone and someone can say, okay, is this the first world problem or the third world problem? And they can say it, of course, with care, you know, not just to get you out of the room. Absolutely. I think helping people reflect on whether they are, you know, like I'll ask a lot of questions at times, you know, I don't do a lot of direct questioning, but in a, in a roundabout way, I, I'd like to tap into people and the quality of their connections in their life uh, can have an inverse, um, you know, there's a correlation there certainly with the quality of your health and how you're feeling and, and your response to pain or your response to healing, absolutely. So as humans, a lot of our sensors that we have is certainly connective. It's, it's devised to connect with humans, you know, and the quality of our depthness um, of how we connect. So how much and how deep we, we love, you know, and this is why we're seeing so much now in the world, you know, we look at, you know, certainly whether it's the medical or, you know, the, the religious institutions or the political, uh, you know, teaching, and we see a lot of, it was like, we don't want to be treated as robots anymore. You know, we want to be treated that we are individuals and we're not just a bunch of collective robots, right? And I think there is a bit of a rebellion go on and going on. And I think that re relates a lot to, you know, the opioids in, in the world that we have, and certainly in this country, you know. Uh, and in the United States, we have, remember, I think we only have between 4 to 7% of the world's population, but then we utilize 41 to 42% of the world's drugs, and that can be a reflection of the health of our nation when you think about it or, or how we relate with things. And when pain shows up, are, are we avoiders and run away? Do we run away from things? Do we freeze? What do we do, you know? Yeah. Or how, how did we learn to deal with pain emotionally or physically? Right. So they, they all tie in, don't they? I, I think so. It's very difficult yeah. to talk about one thing without addressing the other aspect of it, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a... Wonderful tree with many branches. <laughs> so in the office, as I was telling you, and I, I definitely want to tap into people and, and see how they, how many connections do they have in their life. And we also want to see, do they have a lot of connections, but the ones they have, how deep are they going to? Or are they kind of cutting them off? You know, a lot mm -hmm. of times the ego likes to think that it gets hurt or injured, you know, not just physically, but emotionally. So we kind of cut off ties with people. You know, we, we have a story that we run that gives us a reason to not connect with somebody else because it's just too painful to get close to them, right? Right. Yeah, and there are many reasons that we can come up with right. to justify our other reasons. Right. Right. Yeah. I wonder if it's even fair to even ask or address, you know, is it possible to even have kind of a general prescription per se if so first of all, I want to back up from what I understand, have understood about opioids. It's basically about pain relief or pain numbing to the nth degree, to a very large degree. And if that is so, you know, we have it at various levels where whether people are addicted to opioids or not, we certainly as a culture have certain addictions to, um, to numbing pain. And whether the pain is real, true, and visceral, or um, it has been, it, pain can be created psychosomatically, that you, you're thinking of pain in your life and it manifests in your body. Um, and we are a society of first world pain. And it can manifest, to me, it seems it can manifest even greater um, than third world pain. I, I actually lived in what would still in a number of ways be considered a third world country, which is Brazil for a year. Yeah. Um, they're definitely growing and there are many first world qualities. And uh, the other day I shared a video on Facebook, which was, it was a, a, a boy dancing in the street and the dog is actually dancing to like the Samba music and the dog has rhythm. And it's yeah. so hilarious because that rhythm, you hear it all the time. I mean, it's not just during carnival that you would hear samba music and people dancing. And there's literally a party going on around the corner, always somewhere, some of the time, or all the time is what I mean. And it was 
actually a beautiful experience for me in my life because that was not a part of my reality before. You know, my reality was you work hard, you just, you know, stick your nose to the grindstone and um, maybe every once in a while you have fun. And there I was forced out of being myself in that way. I was forced to being into being a, a new person, which was quite a blessing, quite a gift. And so along with this Facebook post I shared, you know, this is what it's like to be in Brazil. I mean, the whole feeling you got from the video was Brazil. And to me, it was actually amazing to see. And I heard about this before I went there. But it's so true that you have people who are literally dealing with third world problems, whether they're living hand to mouth, they're living uh, where there's open sewage and they could get a, a terminal disease very easily. Um, there's there are shootings all the time and I'm not exaggerating. I mean, say all the time and that's like a blanket statement, but they're literally dealing with life and death issues every single day. And most of the time you'll see many of them dancing, smiling, and it's just astounding to me. And I have to even myself keep perspective on how much of this pain that I'm feeling, whether it's physically or emotionally, am I, am I participating in? Well, I think it's reflecting back to that we can choose how we want to feel in the moment, you know, and of course the music helps, right? The sound. Absolutely. Helps. You know, just to, I, I, I do know that video that you put up because uh, you can see the dog and, you know, he's, he's just not waddling his, his tush, but oh. it's his whole spine, you know? Right. And the samba dance is very, I mean, the whole body is moving and it's so simple, you know, it's a very simple dance. But uh, I mean, their hips are moving in ways and, and, and a lot of like Northern Western cultures, you know, especially European, like I grew up in Ireland, so we have like the river dance and, you know, so it's a very, the spine is very straight, right? And the mm -hmm. hips don't move a whole lot, but the feet are dangling a lot. So, mm -hmm. but you'll see that that sense of joy, you know, that they have certainly that very Latin energy, that Samba, it's very rhythmic. It's very rhythmic to the nervous system, isn't it? Absolutely. Like we were talking about the nervous system earlier. You can't help but be tuned in. It's amazing how you know, music, of course, is a vibration. So you're tuning into your, your nervous system is tuning into that way of being. Right. Right. So this, yeah, this at the end of the day comes all back to inflammation and, and uh, you know, all the different modes and ways that we have that we can connect with, you know, the other source, right? And not just mm -hmm. pain and inflammation. And we've certainly seen people, you know, they've done studies with, um, is it schizophrenia where um, they, they, uh, it's multiple personalities, sorry. So they can shift the personality and they can emit different condition states with the two characters that they may have within themselves, right? Right. One might have an allergy and the other personality right. doesn't have that right. traumatic allergy. Right. Yeah, it's astounding. Well, it certainly makes us think about things, doesn't it? For sure, for sure. Yeah. Speaking of thinking about things, I have on my list of topics that I'd like to cover someday is yeah. uh, even the question, you know, should I go or should I be gluten-free? And um, I'm sure you get asked that a number of times, or I've even heard people really oppose, like, I'm not going gluten-free. That's, that's a bunch of BS. Right. Um, but it's a good question to ask. Yeah. But in kind of in closing, I do think that changing a person's diet, if you think that you're experiencing inflammation anyway, which granted, I think we all experience inflammation yeah. and uh, you may not be experiencing it overtly, but just by the pure fact that we are aging uh, is a sign of, you know, a little bit of inflammation over a long period of time. And even just changing your diet just to just to notice, okay, did that help? Because it, to me, it can change things significantly or just eating more fresh foods. Um, there are certainly plenty of um, decent supplements or like uh, the recent kind of panacea of golden milk, right? The, the coconut drink with turmeric and vanilla and, and it's kind of like a chai in a way. Um, you know, that's a great thing to, I think, experiment with, at least in a healthy way. It's easy to um, not overdo it. Right. So there are a few things I think that we can start with. Or what are some things that come to your mind 
if someone might who thinks that they might be experiencing inflammation to whatever degree what are some simple solutions that come to your mind well it's it's easier to think of um, avoidance versus having to think about what should i take Mm -hmm. we know what can cause a fire you know like you brought up gluten and i don't really like to get into it with people about what's right and wrong about gluten but i know by just removing it for a little while from your from your system that it can lessen the burden or the load on inflammation in your body and that is a truth and it certainly tastes better i find anyway you know my wife is very much a uh, gluten-free eater and i tend to eat a lot more of the foods and i feel better from that so and i certainly am not gluten intolerant you know i don't have those biomarkers in my labs um, but i feel better so we're kind of caught up in the whole is it right? Is it wrong? And we want to get away from that dualistic thinking, you know, and look at it as more of, let's take this off the table here because too many of these inflammatory type things can create a burden in our body. So that's the idea of avoidance, you know, that can make a big difference. So refined foods, carbohydrates um, can make a big difference. Anything that's sugar, you know, oriented, you know, um, and then ask for what we should take to kind of help with moving fire and inflammation in the body. So you, spoke about earlier one of the employees with uh, uh in john's work you know using the acute phase product so that has a lot of things like uh ginger um you know um what else does it i think it has curcumin in it or turmeric doesn't it yeah it has curcumin or turmeric if not both it has calcium magnesium right. vitamin c it has the passion flower vegetarian Right. So a lot of those things are, you know, cofactors too. They're nutrients that help the process to make sure that they function better, you know. And so it's a very synergistic product. It's really, really good for that. But then also on the side, like I'm, I'm still a big fan, you know, of the, the omega-3. And of course, the idea of the quality of omega-3 makes a bigger difference too. So in the world of fat, we pay for what we get. So we know that like an over-the-counter omega-3, that's $7. Um, we won't name brands. But you can go up to ubiquinone or krill oil. Krill oil is a higher quality. You pay a lot more money for it. And that's a really good quality. So I love the combination of the, the krill oil with something like turmeric, is a, you know, along with that spice and that herb, you know, along with a fat and a food. That, that's a nice round uh, way to approach it. Yeah, definitely. Those are good starting points. You know, you can't really go wrong right. with a few things like that. Right. So that's very generalized, right? So remove these and introduce these big ones that we know. And we can move those two things aside. We can go into what we call the boutique ones, right? So we can put in, you know, other different refined uh, ones that they're doing now. And like Metagenics is a really cool supplemental company and they're spending a lot of money researching things that can be more bioavailable to us to work with the inflammation. You know? So there's a lot of isolates of food groups that can do that, like the bioflavonoids can certainly help a lot more with that. Another, another good topic. Yes. We could talk a whole other hour just on, on the supplements and, and habits yeah. that can help. But I think it's important just even to be able to identify, you know, the, what these terms actually mean. You know, there's so much on the Internet about it, but to actually kind of personalize it and, and expand it a bit into our lives. That it's not just about the, the aching joints. You know, it could be, you know, what um, the knees symbolize in our life kind of thing, which is another great topic. And it's hard, Tara, because in, in our culture, we were using opioids. You know, it's very hard to, we, we're just using words and language to relate to either our history or our, our interaction with inflammation. And, and a lot of times, you know, people don't know how to give it a word and a feeling and a number. So we can certainly use labs. We have lots of biomarkers in our labs that can, be, um, that can certainly pick up, pick up inflammation. And one of the most common ones that most people will know about, it's called C-reactive protein. It's called CRP. And that's a very common one. We have other ones digestively that can tell us a lot that can pop up. So we look at IgG or an IgM response in the gut. So we have lots of different markers. And if we see a lot of them showing up, then that would dictate the type of therapy that we're going to do, whether it's just a little laxidasical, oh, you'll be just fine. Let's do a little avoidance. Or do we like, no, I need you to hone in on this customized diet. You know, we're going to take more of these nutrients. We're going to work on this infection state. So it's, you know, we can go light. Um, I have a couple of different mentors. Some of them are slow and easy and some of them are fast and hard. So I kind of try and find, engage that with the right client that we're working with, you know, where they are at, and what they can do.
Do you find that people tend to come into you at the acute phase, like when the sirens are going off or, or somewhere in between? What do you usually get? Well, it's always either going to be, uh, I mean, the reality is, is that more women are in tune with their bodies. So, um, so they tend to be the ones that want to come in and they want to work with the underlying causes. Males are more, more motivated out of trauma. So we certainly have to wait for that till we're pushed off the cliff until we break a limb, until blood is seen, you know. Um, so we, that is shifting and changing now. We see the younger generation males are, uh, they want to do more with their bodies. It's, it's not really always about putting a fire out or going after a, a latent pathogen in our body. Now they're into optimizing. So that is certainly the future and into customizing our care towards ourselves. How can I get more out of my nutrition? How can I bring my inflammation down so I can run more? or be more available more in my relationship. So there's a lot of ways to look at it and how you want to approach it. That's interesting that rather than what may have been progressive in the past, which was just being proactive in your health, right. is optimization, which right. automatically covers those bases. Which that is really interesting. I think that's the future of care. And you know, I think we're getting more aware of foods and the impact of foods. So we're getting better at dieting. Absolutely. And I think if we forecast, if we look forward in the future, it certainly is. We see a lot of labs now showing up and they're all about optimizing, you know, certainly the, the NutriVal that you've done recently, you know, that one is one of those ones that's about definitely optimizing your body better. Yeah. I'm curious to dive into that more. I'm working on a lot of website stuff right now. So yes, <laughs> when I need a break, I'm going to study that. <laughs> Good. Well, this has been a really good conversation. Um, I've, I think very enlightening in a lot of ways. And um, so thank you very much for you. shedding some light on this subject and offering some, I think, really good natural solutions too, that it doesn't have to be, you don't have to have the sirens go off to realize that you have a, um, an issue, but to, to take the proactive and optimization approach, I, I do think is a, is a healthy one. And it's very interesting too. It is very rewarding to be on that front end of health rather than on the repair side. Well, one is very interactive. It makes you very involved. And certainly then it makes it more compliant going forward versus a reactive one. It just means I just want this fire put out and leave me be alone, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, great. Um, thank you so much again. And I look forward to our next talk. We will talk soon. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.